Um, I have multiple disclosures. So chronic liver disease is a substantial worldwide problem. Its major consequence is increasing deposition of fibrous tissue within the liver, leading to the development of cirrhosis and its consequences of portal hypertension, hepatic insufficiency, and hepatocellular carcinoma. The staging of liver fibrosis is important to determine the prognosis, surveillance, and prioritization for treatment, and now with the potential of reversibility with drugs, um, this is very important to decide when to start doing these treatments and to follow those treatments to see if they're working. The process of fibrosis is dynamic and regression of fibrosis is possible with treatment of the underlying conditions, and previously the only method of staging the degree of fibrosis was liver biopsy. And liver biopsy is really an imperfect histological reference standard. Um, it does give us both a fibrosis assessment, but also can grade steatosis, necrosis, inflammatory activity, which we still cannot do with ultrasound, but hopefully that'll be coming in the near future. Um, the biopsy is invasive with severe complications and up to 1%, and we really only look at 150,000 of the liver volume, so we don't get a very good sample. And if we look at the literature uh, of pathology, the kappa values vary from 0.4 to 0.9 in studies, so there's very inconsistency on pathologists interpreting the liver biopsies. Um, this is just a table that uh, describes uh, cirrhosis. It consists of really two distinct clinical phases. First, we have fibrosis that leads uh, to compensated cirrhosis, then to decompensated cirrhosis, and then death. And decompensated cirrhosis, and by that I mean the patient has variceal hemorrhage, ascites, encephalopathy, and jaundice. So this is a really easy clinical diagnosis. However, compensated cirrhosis is really not easily diagnosed because it doesn't have any of those complicating features. And if you notice that the mean survival of a compensated cirrhotic patient is greater than 12 years, uh, the median survival of someone with decompensated cirrhosis is about two years. So our goal in using liver elastography is to find these patients uh, either before they get to compensated cirrhosis with severe fibrosis or at the level of they have compensated cirrhosis so the patient can be treated so they do not progress to decompensated cirrhosis. In addition, uh, varices play a role. If there is no varices, the mortality in a uh, compensated cirrhosis is about 1% per year. If there's uh, varices, that increases by a factor of 3 to 3 uh, percent. And the elastography doesn't help there, but looking at our basic ultrasound image uh, is very helpful. There are several methods of looking at uh, liver fibrosis. Um, strain elastography is very limited in the literature, and I'm not going to discuss that at all. There are three ultrasound techniques. Uh, 1D ultrasound technique, which uses a mechanical push uh, or transient elastography. There's two RV techniques, point shear wave or 2D shear wave. So in point shear wave, we're looking at a small volume of tissue in a 2D, we're looking at a much larger area, and there's magnetic resonance elastography, and I'm not going to discuss uh, MRE today. One of the key things I think you have to remember is elastography measures stiffness. It doesn't measure fibrosis. So the stiffness actually is influenced not only by fibrosis, but increased hepatic pressures. So anyone with portal hypertension, hepatic congestion, or increased blood flow from food digestion, or even inflammation will affect the values. So if we use the cutoff values, these things are going to affect uh, where the cutoff value should be, or you may overestimate the degree of fibrosis if a patient has these situations. So uh, point shear wave, we use this ARFI, or acoustical radial force impulse pulse, which is kind of a low, high energy pulse that causes uh, the generation of shear waves. Here we're looking at about a one millimeter area. It's a real-time imaging, so we can look for masses and vessels and avoid those when we do our measurements, and it allows us to find a location or several locations to do these measurements. Uh, 2D shear wave is basically the same principle, but we're doing it many times over a larger area. Then we can put an ROI within that box uh, to get a reading. And the, the 2D shear wave systems can either come as a single image, so you push the button and you get one image, or there are several vendors now that have this in real time so that we have a slow, slow refreshing um, frame rate uh, of repeat measurements. 
And again, this is a real-time technique so we can avoid masses and large vessels to find, identify the best place to put our box. And in 2D, they all use a color coding assessment so you can get a general overview uh, of the area. And again, this allows for uh, averaging every much larger area. Um, this slide was made by uh, Deb Levin from our SRU consensus panel and basically in this one slide details everything we need to know. Um, we've got all these different diseases that all lead to fibrosis and onto um, cirrhosis. We have pretest probability and post-test probability. Age, gender, ethnicity, and lab tests can influence the values. We have patient factors such as obesity, ascites, medications, and fasting comorbidities of acute and chronic disease and vascular congestion. And then we've got the several methods, either MR or ultrasound, and even between vendors we get different values, so the, which software and which hardware you're using, as well as the experience of the reader, as well as the performer of the examination. So to do this very well, we need to have a very strict protocol that's used all the time to get consistent results. Um, so the way we perform this examination is an intercostal approach uh, to the right lobe of the liver is preferred. Um, the reason is if you do substernal or you try uh, to look at the left lobe of the liver, you often apply extra pressure and you're also angling the probe uh, not perpendicular to the liver capsule, which causes some problems. And I like to say we want to optimize the B-mode image because that's telling us we got the best acoustical window. We want to make sure that there's no shadowing. Um, and if we're getting in the sound waves, we're going to get a better, stronger RV pulse. So we'll have stronger shear waves so it's easier to measure. And also, we're always using the B-mode image to track the shear waves. So if you've got a bad B-mode image, you're not going to be able to track those uh, shear waves. Um, the measurement should be taken uh, during a breath hold in the neutral breathing position, and I'll show you a little bit more about that uh, as we move through the talk. The measurement should be taken in the right lobe of the liver. I really don't tell my techs exactly where to do it. Usually it's going to be in segments five, seven, or eight. And again, what we do is we try to find the best acoustical window that's going to give us our best results. We also want to avoid the first one and a half to two centimeters from the liver capsule because we have refractive artifact that'll give us inaccurate measurements. Um, so what we like to do is take the measurements about two centimeters deep to the liver capsule. And the reason is the farther you go down into the liver, the weaker you're going to get the RFE pulse from attenuation. So you're going to get weaker shear waves, which is going to have it more difficult to get good measurements. The optimal place to do these is about four centimeters. So all the probes are kind of focused that your best is going to be at four centimeters. So if you have a person that has two centimeters of subcutaneous tissue, you've got the ideal situation because you always have to be about one and a half to two centimeters below the, the liver capsule. So in those patients that have a lot of subcutaneous fat, it's very difficult to get good exams because you've got everything uh, working against you, and we'll talk about what to do as we go through the talk. You always want to avoid large uh, blood vessels and bile ducts, and one of the reasons is these have um, sharp borders, and you get some refraction of the shear waves, and you get an interference pattern, which will give you inaccurate measurements. And uh, research that we've done that we really haven't published yet is you really want to have the transducer perpendicular to the liver capsule in both, both planes. And the reason is you can really get a lot more energy into the liver by doing that. If you angle the probe, there's a lot of refraction of the energy, and then you're going to get weaker displacements, and you're going to have much more air in the measurements. And it's very uh, significant for small amounts of angling the probe. So again, you want to uh, do the, you put your transducer parallel to the rib space and perpendicular to the liver capsule. Uh, you want to avoid imaging at depth. And again, the reason is the RFE pulse is just like every other ultrasound beam. It's attenuated the deeper you go. The more it's attenuated, the less uh, the amplitude of the shear waves, the more air you're going to have in those measurements. You want to avoid imaging at vessels, and remember this is both in plane and out of plane, so you want to look up and down a little bit and make sure you're not near a vessel. You want to avoid imaging at angles, and again, the reason is the RFE pulse is refracted, uh, and you have less energy, and you're going to get less uh, good uh, measurements. 
You want to avoid imaging in the first one and a half centimeters to the liver capsule because of refractive artifact. And this is just an example showing that with this 2D ultrasound system, you can see that in this normal liver, which should be blue, um, you can see that we've got significant uh, refractive artifact in this first one and a half centimeters. So this is one of the advantages of using these 2D systems with the color maps. You can actually see how far that artifact extends, and depending uh, on the patient, it's usually about a centimeter and a half, sometimes up to two centimeters. So um, there are multiple factors that uh, affect the RV pulse, and I look at, to be able to get a good measurement, I always think about, am I getting enough energy in, into the system? So uh, the amount of tissue displacement is dependent on the strength of that RV pulse. It's attenuated, and therefore, if we take measurements at greater depth, we're going to have more air in the measurements. So most systems will allow you to take measurements to, from eight centimeters from the transducer, but we really try not to do that. We try to say, again, it's about two centimeters below the liver capsule. Uh, another problem you're going to find is that the attenuation is greater with a stiffer liver or a uh, steatotic liver, so there you're going to have, again, more issues. And it's not that steatosis, uh, th the way we're doing things now, changes the measurement, but you just have <coughs> excuse me, more air in the measurement because you're just not getting enough energy into the system. Um, I think when you're starting out, breathing is the most important factor. It's very difficult uh, sometimes to get patients uh, to understand what you want to do, and you want to take the breathing in a neutral position. So if you look at your B-mode image, you'll see the liver moving up and down. You want to kind of take a position in the middle. Um, and we really practice this with the patient before we start doing measurements. And the reason is, as you take a breath in, you actually increase the right heart pressure and it's transmitted to the liver, and you actually increase the stiffness of the liver. So as you're taking breaths in and out, the liver stiffness is, is varying. So you, what you want to do is make sure you try to do this pretty uniformly. Um, this is actually me, and I did these images about 10 seconds apart. Um, so you can see when I did things properly with the breathing, I had uh, no fibrosis, but I became cirrhotic when I did the greatest valsalva I could do. So breathing makes a huge, huge difference, so you really need to practice this. Um, I'm not going to go through the million variables that can affect the, the system because we're running out of time, but each vendor has their own frequency of the RFE pulse, their own bandwidth of the RFE pulse, the software that they're using to analyze the data, the technique they're using. So there is variability between machines, and at this point in time, you really can't use the same cutoff values for each vendor. So you need to go to each vendor and get the appropriate cutoff values uh, for that. This is our protocol, again, one and a half to two centimeters below the liver capsule for this point shear wave. With the 2D shear wave, we try to do this the same way also, but if you want, you can move the box up higher and you can see where the effect uh, of the refractive artifact is. Other things that affect the measurement are extrahepatic cholecystasis. The use of beta blockers is in the literature. I don't understand why, but it is, and again, as I showed you, Valsalva can make a huge difference. Meters per second versus kilopascal. Every uh, ultrasound system actually measures things in meters per second, and we make some assumptions for uh, kilopascals. The FDA would prefer that we use meters per second. However, uh, because uh, fiber scan initially started with kilopascals, it's kind of been with the hepatologists and the drug uh, companies that are uh, paying for these drugs like to use. Um, so we usually end up in our report trying to give both, and I think most vendors, since the SRU consensus has come out, is now going to provide you both of those numbers uh, when you do the measurements. Um, should you take the measurements in the same location or various locations? We take them in the same location, so we do our 10 measurements in one location. And the reason is, this is a bias table that we found uh, from Kiba that, again, because the attenuation of the RV pulse and because there's a bandwidth, we actually get different measurements at different locations. So if you want measurements from different locations, you should take 10 measurements uh, at each location. I don't know where 10 came from, um, but the fiber scan started. It actually makes a lot of sense. 
Um, do you delete bad numbers? I think one of the things that's really going to help you is all the vendors are working on new quality measures, so you'll have maps that will tell you where is the best place within an image to take the measurement uh, or to where to ignore the measurement, um, and I think that's going to really help you. We use uh, the IQR over median of less than 0.3 to suggest this is good data. And um, I really love this measurement because I monitor our sonographer's quality. So I can tell you which sonographer is the best person to do this, which ones are struggling, and, and I really use that. And I can tell that maybe when we started doing these routinely a couple years ago, we were more near 0.3. We're now down to about 0.1. So we've really improved, and I can monitor uh, that we're doing things. And again, we really noticed marked improvement in this value uh, with experience. Um, the one thing that I want to tell you in interpretation, this is the likelihood ratio. So when we looked at a large meta-analysis, instead of trying to come up with a cutoff value, we plotted what was the probability of a certain metavar score for a certain um, shear wave speed. So if we take 1.3 meters per second in this study, you had a 2% chance of being F0, a 10% chance of being F4, a 20% chance of being F3, and a 35% chance of being F1 or F2. So it's really not realistic for us to think in the central area that we're going to do a good job in doing cutoffs. But we really do well with normals as well as abnormals. And that's why the SRU uh, came with the cutoff values that we'll talk about shortly. This is just an example of one of the ways of the uh, quality map. Here we're using a stoplight. Green is good, yellow is caution, red is bad. And here you can see the velocity map where you could do your measurements. And here's this quality map. So what you could do is look at the areas that are green and say, that's where to do your ROI. Um, the SRU consensus, like I said, came up with two cutoff values below which you have a high probability of being normal and a higher number, high probability of being abnormal. And we did that for each of the vendors that was available at that time. We also gave the cutoff values for the Metavar scores. So uh, just quickly, uh, to since I'm running out of time, best practices. Um, we report the median stiffness of the 10 values. This is kind of now what we're getting out from the, the vendors after the SRU, that they're giving you both kilopascals and meters per second. Um, and one of the things that we do that I have these macros. So for every vendor, I have this little thing that we put in the back that shows you the SRU consensus cutoffs and the Metavar scores. And I think this is really helpful for the hepatologists that refer us to us because they can convert from one to the other if they like. And the other thing that I'm always asked is, uh, you know, what do you do if there's a, a, a problem? So after I give the number, and I usually just give the SRU, but things that if the patient comes in and they ate or they have got congestive heart failure, I, I'll usually add a sentence that says, in the setting of uh, patient eating, the degree of liver fibrosis may be estim overestimated. So I like to put that in as the uh, uh, things. If the measurements, uh, the, the IQ over median is higher, then we like to say something like the variance of the measurements is large and therefore the accuracy of measurements may be in question. So we add those into our reports. And since I'm already over, I'm not going to go through that, but here's basically what we did. We have this low cutoff below which everything is normal, a high cutoff above which you have a very high probability of having severe uh, fibrosis or cirrhosis. So to conclude, detection of significant fibrosis and cirrhosis is important for diagnosing, determination of treatment, prognosis, and follow-up of chronic liver disease. The literature supports the non-invasive use of various elastography techniques to assess liver stiffness and to obtain accurate liver stiffness measurements and adherence to a very strict protocol is required, and both patient factors and scanning factors affect results. Thank you.